Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Karen Kastler, State House Bureau Chief for Ohio Public Radio and Television, and I'm pleased to introduce today's forum, a conversation on the state budget. I'm sure you people in this room know that we have a state budget conversation going on. Many people might not know, I tell a joke quite often that I quote Dave Barry, one of my favorite writers, very serious, very uh, respectful writer Dave Barry saying the best way to get television news to cover the state budget is to involve it in a car crash. But you folks know this is going on because you've been informed and you've come to City Club meetings. For instance, two weeks ago during a forum on how Ohio is addressing health disparities, Dr. Amy Acton, who's the new director of the Ohio Department of Health, encouraged the audience to advocate for health and human services in this budget. And she said, I'm quoting here, we're smack in the middle of the budget process. The Senate will be making decisions soon. This is is a time, no matter what your belief, get out there and start talking to those legislators, legislators, because I'm telling you, there is a window of opportunity, and if we do not seize it, this happens once in a generation, and in the middle of all the rhetoric going on, there's something strange happening in our state house, and I do hope you'll take advantage of it. The strange thing is the passage of House Bill 166 out of the House, the proposed budget, uh, 106, I'm sorry, $69 billion two-year state budget. Significant items in that budget include funding for public health programs and children's services, in addition to personal income tax cuts, more money for education, and raising the age to purchase tobacco products from 18 to 21. This time the budget received unusual bipartisan support. 85 to 9 was the final vote, and the last four budgets that we've seen have been almost along party lines, so this was really an extraordinary vote. More House Republicans voted against the Republican-backed budget than House Democrats did. There were seven Republicans who voted for it, or voted against it, along with two Democrats who voted against it. And the bill now is in the Ohio Senate and needs to be signed by Governor Mike DeWine less than a month from today on June 30th. I'm here today with several leaders to discuss what changes can be expected and some of the big things that are in this budget that impact all Ohioans. Joining me on stage are John R. R. Corlett, President and Executive Director for the Center for Community Solutions. His career has included leadership roles in both the public and private sectors, including serving as Vice President for Government Relations and Community Affairs at the Metro Health System and as the State of Ohio's Medicaid Director. Representative Bride Rose Sweeney of Ohio's 14th District which includes Cleveland, Brooklyn, Brook Park, Parma Heights, and Middlebrook Heights is next to him. She was first elected in 2018 and serves on the House Finance Committee, among other committees. And Alicia Washington, Vice President of Government Advocacy for Greater Cleveland Partnership. She represents the business community to state legislators and public officials, educating them about the needs of Northeast Ohio and working to ensure public works projects important to the region make it into the state capital budget, which is a different budget, but still you have a lot to say about this budget. <coughs> So with all that, let's get started. And I want to start with you, Representative Sweeney, since you sat through all those hearings in the House Finance Committee on this budget. And Democrats did vote for it in big numbers. It's, it's a huge departure from what I've seen since I've been at the State House now 15 years. Why? Yes. So oh, thank you so much, and thanks for everyone for being here today. Um, so I am a freshman uh, lawmaker, but I did work at the State House for four years, and I was um, part of the budget process for the past two budgets. So just from my short time at the State House, I can say that um, with this administration, we um, you know, when we started with the state of the state and looked at the governor's um, executive budget, uh, we were kind of shocked. We were. You know, these are democratic talking points that we've been talking for so long. And for the first time in the past eight years, we've stopped talking about tax shifting and tax cuts and started talking about investing and how, um, you know, we got to a point where there's only so much you can go. And so um, one of the big um, 
things that really moved a lot of people over. And we've had um, one of my colleagues, um, Jack Sarah, Representative Sarah, who said this is his, you know, he's been, this is his 11th budget, 22 years. <laughs> this is the first time he has ever voted with the Republican budget. So this is si substantial that um, with the, a lot of the tax changes is really what I believe moved a lot of people that, um, you know, specifically, which I, I'm sure we're going to get into at the LLC tax loophole, where um, is a $2 billion, um, cost the state $2 billion, and uh, we took about half billion dollars of that and reinvested into working class people, and we've seen huge investments. I was the ranking member on the Higher Education Committee. We've seen historic investments in need-based aid in our institutions, and I mean, it was just something that, you know, knowing you're in the minority, knowing this is not the budget that we would put forward, um, that it was the right thing to do within the parameters we had. So, How did minority Democrats end up with so much that you wanted? I mean, is this a tribute to Speaker Larry Householder, who had a year-long battle with the former Speaker Ryan Smith to get Republican support and get Republicans to vote for him? He got more as many Democrats as Republicans to vote for him. Does that really speak to how you got some of the things that you wanted? Absolutely. And so, you know, at the beginning of the General Assembly, um, we had both speakers um, who could not come to a majority within their own caucus come and lobby Democrats. And it was a whole fight within our caucus. Some people said, we want to stay out of it. And I said, if you get to pick your opponent's leader, why wouldn't you want to be a part of that? So, you know, we came and we negotiated and we said there are certain things that we want. We want, we have um, three committees where, um, so it, you have the chairman and a ranking member, which, you know, I'm lower than, but there's three subcommittees that are equal co-chairs and have equal power. Um, and knowing going forward, uh, you know, that we want to have more say, um, you know, outside of the budget, we just unveiled, I think, a prior list of 10 bills um, that have bipartisan support. I'm on one of those bills that we came said, you know, it shouldn't be about Democrat, Republican issues. There's issues we both agree on and there's things, you know, we won't agree on. But if we elect you, we want, these are the kind of the changes and part of that was we want to have a seat at the table, and I think that's reflected in this budget. Yeah, there have been issues where there have been party line votes, but there have been three times where priority legislation has been introduced by both Republican leaders and Democratic leaders, so that's interesting. But you brought up the small business tax deduction, and I want to start talking about that. This, The House changed the budget where the tax deduction did allow small businesses to take the first $250,000 of their income tax-free. The House budget lowers that to the first $100,000 of income tax-free. And so, Alicia, I want to talk to you about this. Uh, this is something that the business community is now pushing back on, saying, hey, this was a deduction that we really relied on. Yeah, so I think, you know, take the long view on the small business tax uh, deduction. It was created in 2013, and in 2014 it had changes made, in 2015 it had changes made, in 2016 it had changes made. We've had it the last three years kind of consistent where it stands, as you quoted, um, but now we're looking to change it again. So beyond the kind of status of where it is, there is a broader issue that we're hearing from our small business members around consistent and stable tax policy and regulatory policy. It's hard to plan for long-term growth when the ball is constantly moving on you, right? And we understand that there are a lot of concerns around loopholes within the small business tax deduction. I think from our perspective, we were more than happy to work with our legislature to ensure that there were tight guardrails around that. But we have heard from many of our small businesses that have used the savings from that tax investment while it may not be much to reinvest back in their companies, to buy new equipment, to support things that they're doing to look towards, at least towards small, towards um, expansion. So it's had a real benefit for the companies that really are able to utilize it in a meaningful way. Um, but again, we're in this place where we're looking to change it again, and that's a big part of the concern. I've talked to a small business owner, at least a couple of them, who have said, yeah, we're, we're using it, it's important to us, but what Representative Sweeney was also saying is this is money that then doesn't get invested back into other causes, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and absolutely, and you know, this is um, something that we've gone back and forth on ever since I've been in the legislature, even as a staff member, um, that Democrats have been fighting for. Um, and it's not that we're against giving small businesses um, the needed, we, you know, I believe that small businesses are really the lifeline of a healthy Ohio, but really making sure that they're targeted to the small businesses that we want it to be. And with the changes that we made, it was 86% of small businesses will have no change to their um, 
their final, you know, what they're going to be receiving. Um, so what was happening is we were not having real small businesses or there were people that didn't even have employees that were receiving this. And we took that money, which I believe was about 500 million, a little bit over, and gave everybody tax cut. So we gave, we eliminated the bottom three um, tax brackets and gave the rest of them a 6.6 .6 tax um, deduction on their income and we just thought that was a better more fair way to do it while still ha helping the small businesses and oftentimes what I hear from the business community is that the real decision makers of um, whether you're going to hire a new employee is on demand and having that so for me we had the best of both worlds where they were still getting um, this tax um, cut but we also put more money in working class peoples to hopefully spur more economic growth so to me that's why um, it was one of my biggest moving factors to vote for this budget was this fairness in our tax structure. Before we move off that I want to give Alicia the chance to respond to some of that and also even Speaker Larry Householder said that he felt like the one hundred thousand dollar level was best because once you get above that he felt like it strayed into the point where people were just pocketing the money. And no again I, you know I think there was a real question around how do you ensure there are tight guardrails on the small business tax deduction to ensure that the small businesses that we truly want to support and can use this well can and do so. I think our, you know, our, our long-term kind of view on this will now be to see what actually happens in the Senate, because there are different points of views there in terms of what that all means. But then, whatever policy we set, can we have stability and predictability around it? Can we leave it in place to ensure that, again, our businesses can plan for long-term growth? And Senate Finance Chair Matt Dolan, who couldn't be here today, and, and there were several Republican leaders who were invited but couldn't be here for whatever reason, a lot of scheduling issues and that sort of thing, he has specifically said he wants to look at that, that he feels that it's a tax increase on small businesses to change that. But, John, I haven't been ignoring you. I want to bring you into the conversation, even though this is really I'm great. about everything. <laughs> <laughs> there were, and Representative Sweeney brought up uh, the idea that this budget really made some changes for income taxes, which we've seen income tax cuts in the last, what, four budgets now? Right. Uh, this one, though, cut taxes, no taxes for anybody making under $22,500 a year, and everybody above that getting a 6.6% .6 tax cut. Is that something from your research that you feel is, is going to pay off for people? Is that something that is wanted and needed in Ohio? Well, I, I think there certainly is tax relief needed for low-income working families in the state. I guess what I would rather have seen is an earned income tax credit that's refundable. I mean, because we know from all the research that a, an earned income tax credit is the single most effective way to reduce poverty. Um, it's the most effective poverty fighter that we have from a policy standpoint. And so I would rather have seen that. You know, there were increases in the earned income tax credit in the transportation bill, but they weren't refundable. Um, and so I don't think, you know, we shouldn't be taxed people into poverty and I think that's what we do sometimes when we don't have an earned income tax credit in place and when you that's talk refundable. about refundable tax credit that means that it doesn't just zero out tax liability right. people can actually get money back and it takes into account the other taxes that they pay their payroll taxes sales tax other things like that 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 disproportionately affect low-income working families Let's talk about another fun thing in the House budget. And I think there's a lot of fun things in the House budget because <laughs> I, I guess I'm a geek like that. But uh, the, the film tax credit, which I know is incredibly important in Northeast Ohio, $40 million film tax credit that the House budget zeroed out. And I want to start with you, Representative Sweeney. Why? What's, what's, wrong, with, what's wrong with the film tax credit? <laughs> yeah, um, I actually had one of the amendments to expand it to uh, the $100 million working with some of my Republican colleagues. So, and I know that um, it's up in the air. I mean, some Democrats, some Republicans, but I think what the speaker was doing, I mean, kind of was setting the agenda is um, when we were looking at, um, I know from the executive budget to ours, there was um, discrepancies in the amount of money we're going to have. So we started off having to cut from the executive. And so, and some of these changes. And so he looked at, and we did, I think, other um, good policies. We looked, there was a tax credit for jet planes that we got rid of. So he was just trying to short money. And I think that it's, you know, I hope it gets back revived in the Senate. I mean, it's, um, 40 million, and the Senate just did a standalone bill, um, unanimous, um, to increase it to the 100 million and include other the theatric productions. Um, so I'm hopeful that will get in. I mean, when you talk about one of my biggest issues as one of the youngest members in the General Assembly is that we have more people leaving the state of Ohio than almost anywhere else, and those are young people. And when we talk about um, this specific tax credit, it's 5,000 jobs, and most of those are millennials and young people. And we've this has been here for 10 years. We've been building the infrastructure around it. Cleveland State has um, created a film school um, to support this and to have a perfect 
perfect pipeline, and it's you know jobs that affect you know go on what you just think of film. So I'm very supportive of it, and I know that. Um, but when you're every time you um, tax or do a tax credit, that's money that you're not investing in somewhere else. So I think that's where um, that got next in the house. You can just really a, see, oh, okay. I was just going to say, you can really see the, the difference here. In, you mentioned that uh, the, the Senate actually voted to extend that tax credit to theatrical productions. They voted unanimously to do that on the same day that the House Committee voted unanimously to cut the film tax credit. So it definitely is a difference here. So go ahead. Well, Alicia. no, I mean, that was the exact point that Karen, that I was going to underscore on what Representative Sui had to say. I mean, this was happening at the same time as one chamber was looking to increase the incentive while another chamber was looking to roll it back for, you know, understandable reasons. You know, how do we ensure there's more revenue going to things that really support working people across Ohio? So I think when we start to think about even a conference committee on this bill, it's going to be really interesting to see some of the issues that get set up for a compromise with this being a key one. And it's important that people who support the film tax credit have said it's not just about Hollywood jobs. And mm -hmm. certainly Speaker Householder has said he cares more about Bob Buckeye in Beverly, Ohio than Bob De Niro in Beverly Hills. But uh, <laughs> I've also heard the comments of, that there are other associated jobs that work with people in the film industry, tailors and, and other people who are supporting costuming and makeup and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the first um, economic impact studies that Cleveland State did on the film tax credit found that for every dollar invested, a little over $2 were put back into the economy, which supported a number of things that you just talked about. Greater Cleveland Partnership was supportive of the film tax credit when it was first created. Uh, we didn't get to a point of actually forming a position on the thought of how to increase it from the 40 to the 100 million, which is why it will be interesting to see how that starts to shake itself out as the budget continues to move through the process. But, you know, it's a part of what are the things that we are doing to incentivize the growth of certain industries in our community. And clearly a lot has happened in Northeast Ohio to really support a lively film industry. So we'll see where all this takes us. John, you want I was to jump just, in? I was just going to say that I think what was good about what the House did was it opened these things up to s debate. I've always thought that once you get a tax credit in the budget, it's like winning the lottery. It never gets looked at again. Mm -hmm. And you just collect that year after year, and there's never any serious review. And so I think the House, by their action, opened all this up for a conversation. I think that's a good thing. There has been a review, though, of tax breaks. And but not by the legislature. Well, <laughs> there, was a, there was a task force that came up that, that actually spent like 18 months looking at tax breaks and decided to change none of them. So <laughs> right. this does happen. But I, I, right. I want to ask uh, Representative Sweeney about this, and this is a little touchy, I guess, but in a way, if the tax credit is restored, will it even matter now that you've got uh, Disney and Netflix and at least eight other production companies saying that they may not do business in states that have these abortion bans, like the six-week abortion ban that's been called the heartbeat bill in Ohio? Yeah, I mean, this is a bigger, you know, from especially my colleagues that we're talking about, why do young people keep moving? And it's because of some of these issues where, you know, I don't want to be known for. I vote against the heartbeat bill, and it's um, unfortunate, you know, however, I'm not in the majority. You know, you can do what you can. But at the end of the day, um, you know, with the types of films, we're not bringing in, you know, huge Hollywood stars, I'm sure some people are, but I had a friend um, who graduated from St. Ignatius, um, had to, after college, move to California to pursue being a filmmaker, and as soon as we brought this tax credit here, he moved back, and um, he had Helen Hunt, he, you know what I mean, it was a small budget film, but now it's being um, produced all around the world, in Scotland in a month, and at the end of it, it'll say made in Cleveland, so at the end of the day, I think that, you know, it's bigger than just this, but all of our actions as lawmakers have major impacts and I wish that um, my more colleagues viewed it as that way is that we want to be inclusive this is a place where everyone wants to come where everyone can feel safe and that's just not what we've seen with some of these other um, social issues we've been focusing on. I want to ask Alicia uh, one of the other things that Representative Sweeney brought up is some of the other tax cuts and tax breaks that got cut back. One of them was a tax break, uh, or it, it was a closing a loophole on fractional jet ownership companies like Flight Options out in Cog County Airport. So are you concerned about that, the closure of, of that tax loophole? You know, it's something we'll have to take a closer look at as an organization. It's not something that has kind of risen to the top the way the small business tax deduction has for our members, but something we're watching closely. All right, well, let's move on a little bit and talk about uh, local government funding and, and some of the things that local governments pay for, like public transit and um, uh, uh, children's services and some of these issues. And so, John, when you look at uh, the funding for local governments in this budget, I mean, 
there was never a promise from Mike DeWine during the campaign that he would restore the local government fund. But it seems like there's been efforts to try to help local governments with some of these big costs that they have, like children's services, a doubling of money for children's services, also more money for indigent defense for people who go to court who don't have money to defend themselves in court. Are, 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 you, are you pleased with what you see? I, I, on those two measures, I think I am. And I think what's a little different about that is that they're putting money in specific purposes. It's not just, here's a check, it's we want you to invest you know, in child welfare, we want you to invest in indigent defense. It helps the county uh, either way, and it's important to Cuyahoga County because you know, our Health and Human Service Levy Fund is facing a deficit at the end of this year. And so these dollars could uh, be a big help to Cuyahoga County in terms of all the children that they have taken into custody because it has gone back up. The opioid epidemic has had that impact on our child welfare system. Yeah, you know, the other piece that we're still working on is around getting some additional funding for a category of kids called multi-system youth, youth that have really deep end, deep mental health issues, developmental disability issues, cost local governments a lot. And it's come to our attention, one of the reasons it's come to our attention is we've heard from a lot of parents who've had to actually give up custody of their kids and put them into the child welfare system so that they can get the medical care that they need and so we hope that that gets addressed as part of this budget process as well. Yeah, there's been a lot of news coverage of that especially lately and, and there was actually testimony this week from parents who were saying please help us to try to figure right. out how to get around this but I also want to ask you about public transit. I've talked to uh, Center for Community Solutions to your colleague Lauren Anthes and others about the idea of public health being a lot of different things and helping people move around town and, and get to doctor's appointments and get to health care and that sort of thing is important. Uh, I mean transportation is one of the biggest options obstacles we hear from when we talk to um, uh, uh, low-income residents in Cuyahoga County. We just were in the process of uh, crunching the data from a survey that we did of low-income residents of the county and transportation and issues with cars and all that stuff rises to the top of the list. You know, they have issues around medical care or food, but they're able to get those things addressed. But where they can't where they can't seem to get the resources, where there aren't enough resources are around transportation. And you did get some uh, re-establishment of some funding in the transportation budget which was signed at the well it was supposed to be signed by March 31st it was signed somewhere in the beginning of April but there, there's yeah. still a desire to have more yeah and I, I think you know there's some aspects of the operating budget that have to be addressed uh, as it relates to transportation as well but I think people feel positive about that I mean you know it was the first time it felt like there was an open door to talk about transportation that that door I think had been pretty well uh, firmly closed in the past and so you know it gets to your earlier point about this sort of bipartisan nature nature of the legislature, I think that helps move a lot of things. And I think the governor sent a strong message by the kind of people that he put in charge of state departments, really good, solid uh, uh, people that are there uh, to do the job. And I would just, I want to throw in on that point because this was an issue that the partnership was actively engaged in right. around increased funding for public transit at the state level. And I will say that um, it was, it was a bit of a moment of just pausing when you realize first what the House did in terms of the increase in federal flex dollars to 100 million and then ultimately what landed in being 70 million in state GRF. That was not the path I think we thought we would take. We thought it'd be a much harder battle to get folks to really be talking about transit at state level. But from our perspective, even just looking at the region, this is one of the biggest issues that we in Northeast Ohio and Cuyahoga County will be tackling, right? Like looking at our greater uh, Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, um, how it's been funded, does the system kind of match where we are moving as a region, the people that are mm. living here, the job hubs that are here, and what work is needed to ensure that not just additional state funding is poured into the system to support what needs to happen, but when we look at how our system is largely locally funded, how do we then ensure that we are designing the system and maximizing our local resources in a way to ensure that we have a state-of-the-art transit system for the future? So this is a big topic even beyond the state budget and the transportation budget that will continue in our community in Cincinnati and Columbus for a while. Representative Sweeney, is it difficult sometimes to talk to some of your colleagues about the need for public transit since there's a lot of people in leadership who are not from urban areas. They don't see public transit every day like people in Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Akron, Canton, Toledo see it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That was going to say it was not easy. I mean, when we were talking about we were facing increasing taxes and, you know, there's some um, people in the Republican Party that they just weren't going to do it. And so, again, the speaker had to come to us and this was what we as we came together and said, this has been neglected for years and this is something that, mm -hmm. you know, we were uh, in the back room, I'm on the Finance Committee, holding it up saying no we're staying strong this hundred million we're not moving and we got it and it was a historic I mean 
they do they did not want it I can tell you it was a fight <laughs> and I mean even on the floor the remarks by some of our colleagues who just were so irked <laughs> that we got this in there and I mean saying I see buses go every day empty and I'm and I go, but it's a bigger, you know, and I, in growing up in Cleveland, you know, I spoke with the RTA the other day. It, what, part of what made me successful is I grew up near on the red line. They got me to John Carroll to school, got me to my unpaid internships downtown. And it was such, I didn't even own a car until I was 21. And that was a part of my development, which got me to here. And it's not the most, for lack of a better word, sexy things to talk about when you're talking about healthcare, education, but you can't talk about that without people having access to get there. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's people in, that legis in the legislature that fundamentally do not think that we should have any or think that, I mean, so, but I think it comes from the rural areas who don't really have it, but it's such a huge impact. And I would invite them all to Cleveland, would show off um, what we do here all day. And I think that I'm very happy that we were able to, you know, come to a compromise on that. I want to talk to John about health care specifically mm -hmm. in the budget. Typically, budgets have had a lot of Medicaid policy. Right. And uh, is that the, true this time? It is. It is. <laughs> yeah, it I is mean, it, it's a huge portion of the budget, so obviously. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, that's where the money is in Medicaid. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is a lot in this budget, um, uh, some good, some bad, and some prevented. Um, you know, one of the things that sort of erupted at the last minute in the House um, uh, was a proposal to bring back a, a, a Medicaid waiver uh, that would require um, uh, people in Medicaid, uh, ch children, the expansion group, or not children, uh, parents of children and the expansion group to go through a whole series of sort of bureaucratic steps in order to keep their Medicaid. It would affect about a million people. Um, it would have cost healthcare providers about $2.5 billion in lost revenue uh, over five years. Um, and so the resulting loss of jobs that would happen because of that. So it was a, it was a bad deal. Uh, that thanks to my friends over here, uh, we uh, got it taken out uh, the next day. Uh, but I would expect, uh, I expect it to come back. Um, uh, there's that thing called the conference committee where the House <laughs> and Senate come together. And uh, it's a, you know, we have hearings out in the open, uh, but behind the scenes, I would expect an effort to add that back into the bill uh, at the last minute or some other sorts of restrictions on the Medicaid program. I, you know, I think there, to, to uh, the representative's point earlier, there are representatives still there in Columbus who are fundamentally opposed to expansion, fundamentally opposed to Medicaid, I think, in some ways. And so uh, they will uh, do what they can to try and uh, uh, I think cripple that program. And you're talking about the Healthy Ohio program, Correct. which would allow for small premiums and co-pays right. for up to four in 10 Medicaid recipients, yeah. which and is 10% of the Ohio population. Yeah, it's about one in 10 Ohioans. And it's modeled after a program in Indiana. And what we know from Indiana is that half of the people dropped off the program because the largest single reason was they couldn't afford the premium. About half said they couldn't afford it. Uh, another quarter just dropped off because it was so complicated they couldn't sort of follow along with it. Um, and so they weren't able to stay on the program. And so those people fall off. They become uninsured. Uh, they still show up at hospitals. Hospitals are still going to take care of them. They're just not going to get paid. And that cost then gets shifted onto all of us, um, and it sort of leaves uh, everybody worse off. The argument has been, though, that requiring those folks to pay some sort of premiums gets them used to doing that so when they do eventually leave Medicaid then they will have incorporated that into their planning but I want to ask Representative Sweeney how did that 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 was really kind of a surprise moment that uh, Representative Jim Butler who was backing this stood up on the House floor and said I'm pulling this out it's kind of a, a surprise yes so it was a surprise to many of us so I mean I think um, it was the night before in um, committee. Um, we got the changes an hour before committee, and the changes, you know, we had an hour before voting on this, and it's, you know, not the actual text. It's the Republicans' titles of, and we went through every single one of them, me and my other colleagues, and we said we're okay with these changes. There's a few things we didn't like, but we're like, this is overall. We, we voted on it, and in the middle of the night, someone found the Healthy Ohio program on there, and so. Um, we went and we said, you know, this, this is what we talked about when we elected you speaker. That because that, this that's kind of shenanigans would go on and was really um, frustrating about not being able to do my, your job as an, you know representative. I represent 120,000 people and I wasn't even able to know what I was voting on because they omitted that and so they said it was an error and. I mean, it's very rare for the people who are in power to sit there and take something they want off in the House floor. Um, so I, I, I applaud uh, the Speaker and leadership mm -hmm. for doing the right thing and 
Um, you know, but that's why you always have to make sure we have our allies out there looking through actual reading the, uh, the text of it. But they did say that they will probably come either in conference committee or its own standalone bill. This is something they're really going to push. And I know me and my colleagues will be adamantly against it. Well, the legislature did make a lot of changes in the last couple of budgets that specifically related to Medicaid. Former Governor John Kasich actually vetoed some of them, including one that would have stopped, halted the enrollment in Medicaid expansion. Right, right. He, that There was a freeze put on that. Governor Kasich had vetoed that. And that never got overturned. So I, I think that uh, I had been expecting there to be a lot more action in Medicaid by state lawmakers. But Governor DeWine, during the campaign, Mike DeWine had said that he was supportive of Medicaid expansion with some changes. Right, right. And I think, you know, the department is already working through some of those earlier measures that the legislature approved. They've gotten a, a work requirement waiver already approved by CMS. They have to work through the operational issues. They said that'll be effective in 2021. So, so I think, you know, they've operated in good faith and, uh, and respected, you know, what the legislature has done. Before we move to audience questions here, I want to ask Alicia about opportunity zones. It's another thing that's in the budget. There would be there would be a 10% non-refundable income tax credit for investment in opportunity zones. Ohio has 320 of those around the state. Mm -hmm. Why why opportunity zones? What would these things do, and, and why is this a good idea? Yeah, so opportunity zones actually started really back in 2015 with uh, standalone legislation at the federal level looking to think through another way to ensure investment happens in distressed communities across the country. Um, we've had a number of programs throughout the iteration of community economic development tools, empowerment zones, new market tax credits, historic preservation tax credits. Uh, this was the latest attempt at it that would really focus in how to get more uh, private capital, capital gains into play in development projects that currently were just sitting on the sidelines. So you're talking about trillions of dollars that uh, you know, studies have shown that are there for potential investment, at least a billion that folks are thinking that could actually happen within the Opportunity Zone program. Um, so how do you ensure that capital can actually move for good benefit? Uh, so, you know, 2015 standalone legislation, fast forward to the federal tax reform law that we had to where a version of the Opportunity Zone Act got included in that and became law. And it was a mad rush then for states <laughs> to figure out how do we start to accommodate this new federal tool. Uh, governors had a 90-day window to submit census tracts from their states that could be qualified as opportunity zone areas. Uh, the previous administration did that for Ohio, so the 320 that you talked about is what got selected. And now states across the country are beginning the process of how do we build incentives on top of the federal benefit to really attract investor activity to our particular area. So Ohio's proposal that started as standalone legislation in the Senate and is now in the budget is to create this 10% income tax credit um, for investors to put their money into Ohio Opportunity Zone funds. The partnership has been following this issue very closely, has been actively engaged. We have a lot of work on the ground that's happening through a number of our colleagues, through Cleveland Development Advisors, to build Opportunity CLE and really think through how we are smart about our strategy. But our longstanding position has been is that if we are not thoughtful about social impact as a part of the policy, we may not see the types of investments that we want to see. So we will be watching and continuously advocating around the budget on this piece to ensure, if not in this process, but soon thereafter, we're having a serious conversation about social impact and how to ensure those dollars go where we need them to go. And this is something that Mike DeWine talked about during the campaign. Quite a bit. He had built a whole big part of his economic plan on right. opportunity zones and using them. So he hit the ground running in a yeah. sense by saying, I'm going to do this. Right. So, well, it's time now to do the next phase here. We were listening to a forum, a conversation featuring John Corlett, president and executive uh, Executive Director at the Center for Second Community Mets. Solutions, <laughs> Representative Bride Rose Sweeney, like and Alicia Washington, Vice President of Government Advocacy for the Greater Cleveland Partnership. I'm Karen Kassler, State House Bureau Chief for Ohio Public Radio and Television. We're about to begin the audience Q&A now, and we welcome questions from everybody, City Club members, guests, students, those of you joining via our radio broadcast or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphone today is Content Coordinator Bliss Davis. May we have the first question, please? Hello, good morning. And uh, this is a great conversation, especially around the impact of health and human services and economic development and the intersection. So I really appreciate the panel's conversation this morning. Um, I want to go back to an earlier part of the conversation. We we're talking about uh, tax cuts and revenue and the opportunities uh, that might be lost as a result of that lost revenue. Um, one of the things that um, was mentioned earlier was that we uh, want to have uh, 
the ability to understand the impacts of how tax cuts play out. We talked about the small, uh, the small business exemption, for example, and that it might be too early to see um, should we make changes. On the other hand, um, we also, like John said, that uh, tax revenues, um, once they're in place, or tax cuts once they're in place, you know, often stay there. And so my question is, in the view of the panel, what is a reasonable expectation to evaluate if a tax cut um, has played out the way you expected? At what point is it too short to understand? And at what point, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? Excellent question. <laughs> well, <laughs> so good. I, 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 I guess. I guess the way I'd approach that, Will, is I, um, you know, so one of the things I was surprised about in this budget was the fact that there's no new state investment in child care, in state dollars. It's all additional federal money, but, but no additional state dollars. And I was surprised by that because I heard a lot of people talk during the gubernatorial campaign about the importance of early care and education. And, and for me, when I think about economic development, I think the single most effective thing we can do to improve the economy of this state is invest in early care and education. It's you know been proven, uh, been researched by folks from the Federal Reserve and elsewhere, um, and so I think sometimes we get we we get misplaced about where we think investments might produce economic benefit, and I think that's a place where we could do it. So I think you know that's and I was surprised by that that there isn't any sort of dedicated state dollars and that we didn't increase eligibility for child care uh, because that is such a huge cost for families and you know we've written a lot about this notion of the benefit cliff that once you get to a certain point you kind of lose everything and one of the ways we could sort of reduce that is by uh, increasing the eligibility for child care subsidies for working families in the state and I think that would do a lot um, to improve the economy of this state and so that's that's how I guess I would look at it and think about it yeah, I mean, I would add to that, right? So to a point that Karen earlier, early, made, made early on in this conversation is that there was a tax expenditure review committee that was established, right? And I think in some ways we could still view that as a tool that could be used to dive into some of these questions, including mm. the one that you asked, Will, right? But I think from our perspective, um, again, you know, a part of that question is figuring out what is the right balance of time because you look at another issue area building on education, our K through 12 system, how we fund our schools, um, graduation requirements, policies, really important policies that determine what the future for our children will look like. Are they college and career ready? You know, how does that happen? But if the if the line constantly keeps changing because there's always a new policy idea on how to approach that, are we actually benefiting kids at the end of the day? So I think there are one of many policies that kind of fall within this framework and hopefully there are future legislative tools including you know strong comprehensive review of some of this to figure out what some of that looks like and then a commitment just to leave it alone mm -hmm. once we've done it. <laughs> well I think that there are also research outlets that are doing research though sometimes it conflicts with other research. I mean our <laughs> friends at Policy Matters Ohio have done some research on film tax credit that right. conflicts with some of what you had said earlier. So it's it's there are groups that are looking into these things, but it's a really interesting question. So mm -hmm. we have another question. I think my question is related. So it's a question about how data is used in creating budgetary mm -hmm. priorities. So I'm an entrepreneur and right now I have a like very limited budget. So there's like a ton of things that I could invest in that might move my business forward, um, but I don't always know what those are. So the challenge is to figure out where is going to be the most bang for my buck? Like, how do I know it's going to work? So where does, um, when you talk about policy, there's ideology, there's lobbying, but how do you, you know, in terms of knowing what, what works, where do, is, does data come in to these conversations at all? And, and if so, how? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, in the legislature use um, the Legislative Service Commission, which is a nonpartisan body that actually, you know, I don't actually write the laws, but, you know, I have an idea and they actually do that. But part of that is we use them as um, to do research requests to see how, um, you know, I'm looking at doing a sales uh, cut on textbooks and I go to them and they can sit there and tell me exactly what this is. They'll run the numbers, they'll run the simulations on what I can do before I even want to um, enter into that. So that is a state agency filled with very, very smart people. But outside of that, there are other groups. You know, personally, I use, you know, Policy Matters Ohio and some of the other think tanks. Um, but you have, um, you know, I always like when, and not everyone does this, but when you're looking at um, making any kind of policy change, is 
talking to the people that's going to impact and talking, you know, because sometimes we get a little too focused on the numbers and you're trying to help somebody, but without talking to the people that are the shareholders or the investors, the teachers, the parents, it can kind of fall flat. So I think it's a variety of different ways, but we do have avenues within the state to help us get concrete numbers when they do exist. I was going to the other thing, you know, we've done is, um, we produced at Center for Community Solutions, we produced profiles of every legislative district in the state. And one of the things when you look at it, you realize that every district, no matter whether they're represented by Republicans or Democrats, whether they're rich or poor, have people who live in those districts who depend on SNAP you know, to pay for their food, depend on Medicaid to pay for their health care. That it, it's universal, that everybody depends uh, on those programs. So I think I think data is really important. I think you know, obviously good lobbying is also important. We see that as well. <laughs> Columbus uh, but you know our job is to connect the data with the representative and from our experience we found people pretty open to having those conversations um, and are interested in the data you know um, we I've gone into a couple of member offices and actually seen that they have our little profiles hanging up I'm like good good yeah remember you've got people who depend on you so and people can find those profiles on your website they can <laughs> they are excellent I do use them <laughs> and you do them yeah. for state house state senate as well as congressional yep. districts yep. So. absolutely another question Thank you so much. Maybe I'm a geek like Ms. Kassler, but I think this is a fascinating discussion. <laughs> My question is to Ms. Uh, Washington. Uh, when the Kasich administration um, cut local government funding, I thought it was sort of a cynical or sneaky way to force local governments to consolidate uh, or regionalize, which didn't seem to occur. And so uh, my question is, is regionalization, I mean, there's so many um, obstacles to regionalization, uh, race, class, and I also think people like having local government and they don't want to give it up. So is regionalization something that's sort of dead in the water? Uh, do, you, do you see any possibility that it could ever occur on a, on a widespread basis in the state? It's an interesting question and clearly it's a conversation that our community is starting to have, right? Cleveland.com has run a number of stories um, looking at the St. Louis model that has now failed. Um, but really beyond that, you know, how can we have this kind of conversation in this community? And this isn't the first time it's been brought up, right? We've had ebbs and flows of this conversation on regionalism and how do we think about um, consolidation in government in a way that is more efficient, makes our region more competitive, and actually allows us to potentially realize cost savings that we can invest in the things that matter the most. It will be interesting to see where all of this goes. I mean, uh, the partnership has recently gone through a tax study to really understand how does our tax burdens line up compared to uh, sister cities or places around us. It's one study, right? So it tells us a piece of information. There's still a lot more to unpack, but um, I think as well it will be interesting to see how that conversation continues in this community and if we actually reach a place, if it's not the big picture of it, are there smaller portions of it that we may be able to do within a reasonable time frame? That question makes me think. I talked to the Republican representative who's sponsoring the ban on plastic bag bans bill. And he said the reason that he wants that to happen is because he's concerned about all the different jurisdictions that can tax in the state. And I wonder if that might, is the desire to have fewer jurisdictions that can tax, does he mean merging jurisdictions that can tax or something? It, it's, but it's an interesting. It's an interesting yeah. idea. I mean, I can't speak yeah, for it no, as sure. a member, but it's interesting. Yeah, no, I just, um, and this is something I've been watching closely, and, you know, it's just, you know, we all, I'm a firm believer, as many other public uh, politicians have said, you know, the government close to the people knows the people best. I believe in local control. Unfortunately, um, I hear that rhetoric, unless it doesn't fit your particular agenda, you kind of leave it on the wayside. And so we've seen that time and time, and time again, this um, legislature, uh, the majority has um, eroded certain local control. And so um, I personally believe in empowering our local governments. They know the people, the best interests of the people. And I, you know, down there, I work to always have that in my forefront. And certainly the Supreme Court gets caught into yes. a lot of those yes. arguments yes. as well. <laughs> Another question. Speaking of Policy Matters, Ohio. <laughs> Hi, I have a question for Ms. Washington. Um, we've seen the business income deduction, which allows people to not have to pay tax on the first $250,000 and then pay a lower rate on their income above that. Uh, and the data show that it has not led to increased employment, uh, output, any real economic uh, improvement. 
uh, while certainly there are some anecdotal examples, that's what the aggregate data show. In light of the needs that you've outlined for transit, but also, for example, our lead poisoning issue, which uh, certainly looms very large here in Cleveland, yeah. why wouldn't it make sense for we to go ahead and accept what the House has done in limiting that deduction and using it to support public transit and to, to uh, deal with our lead issue? Yeah, well, thank you. It's a great question. And it's, uh, you know, this is, these are the challenges that we're facing. But again, if you were to ask any of our small business members that exact question, they would give you, again, examples of how they have used the investment back in their business. Again, we agree that there are guardrails that could be put around that tool to ensure that it's not being abused in the way that we've heard the stories about. But there's still work to be done on what the Senate will do to ensure that either we find a compromise on that or if it's restored to where it was. Um, but again, our members have spoke to how this tool has been beneficial for them. So that's the story that we're ensuring is actually shared with our elected leaders in Columbus. Before we get to another question, I want to bring up what Zach Schiller just mentioned, uh, the lead abatement. There are a lot of things like that in this budget that specifically relate to especially kids, which yeah. I talked about in the beginning. Children's initiatives, the opioid crisis, uh, things that really speak to public health concerns. Was that surprising to you, John, or to you, Representative Sweeney? I'll let you go. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, it wasn't to me because, I mean, when you saw Governor DeWine, I mean, the first person he appointed was his sort of, what I call the czar of children's issues, you know, in the administration. And so that to me was a, a important sign and it, and it played out in this budget and it's playing out in how they're pursuing policy within government already. So I think, um, I think they're off to a good start. You know, it's been a long time. Uh, I would actually say it has not been since Governor George Voinovich that we've had a governor sort of focused on kids to the extent that Governor DeWine is focused on. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, you know, I'd like to say that these are some of the issues that we as Democrats have been talking about for years and I'm very happy that it's finally caught up and, you know, that we could work together and that it's been kind of, doesn't have to be a partisan issue or, you know, meddled in whatever. Um, but I think specifically I was really excited about, you know, the lead issue and within this budget there is a um, capped at a $10 million tax credit for individuals in homes that have the exposure, um, $10,000 per house. And you know, when I asked the director about the, the question, it seems like a drop in the bucket, but at least, you know, this, I mean, when you look at the numbers and the exposure of lead, and you're talking about, I mean, a billion dollars of economic loss, but to me, it's, you know, that means nothing when you're talking about children's lives and mortality and having permanent brain damage, you know, just because of the home they're in and the, you know, it's, it's you know, just moved to a new house. I mean, you're really understanding that these are in economically um, poorer areas and that we have a duty. And so I think that this was a good first step um, through the state, I know the city of Cleveland, the county, our, um, you know, private sector, all working to get this issue. And it's just, it's so important. The 10 million is not enough, but it, you know, at least it's, it's a step in the right direction. Another question. Yes, uh, the Third Frontier Program was initiated under Governor Taft as Ohio's program to really foster cutting edge technology and entrepreneurship. And it didn't seem to be a priority under the Kasich administration. And there was a recent article suggesting it's uh, running out of funding. So what is the future of the Third Frontier? And if it's not the future, is there an alternative program to focus on emerging technologies in Ohio? That's a great question. I have a perspective. You know, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Please. Please. So the Third Frontier is a program that uh, we have been um, actively interested in, helped to support uh, since its creation at the partnership. And you're right, we're kind of at this point of time where the last bond that was passed to support the program, the money should have run out in 2015 had it been spent at the level that was expected. We are now in 2019. It feels like about to hit 2020, and it's been a slow trickle. There's about uh, $200 million left in that program, give or take. Um, and it is the question that because the last administration did not prioritize it as something to potentially think about reauthorizing, and I think there's still a lot of learning that the new administration is doing around it, what will the future look like? This gets to a bigger conversation around what does an innovation economy look like for Ohio? What are the things that we've learned from the first years through now of the Third Frontier and other programs like it? Where are the gaps? Where are the things where we need to double down on investment or think about it in a new way? Uh, you know, support for minor minority 
entrepreneurs is one of the spaces where I think the third frontier had a gap that there are opportunities to think about how we expand mm -hmm. that moving forward. So I know there are a number across the business and civic community that are very interested in this conversation. There's local work happening here in Cuyahoga County um, involving the partnership and under, other funders and partners to really study what an innovation economy looks like for Northeast Ohio. But this is a central question to determine how do you deploy the dollars that are left in a way that will continue to support the intent of the third frontier? And then if it's not the administration that will make the move, what is the role of advocates on the ground to really push for another iteration of what that will be? You don't have to call it the third frontier. We can call it something else at this point in time. But I think the intent of that type of investment and building an innovative economy um, that fills in the gaps and where we missed out in the first years of this needs to be a focus. And I think it probably is, given that Lieutenant Governor John Houston wears like six hats, six hats and right. one of them <laughs> is the head of Innovation in Ohio, Ohio, which is an office specifically dedicated toward the innovation economy. That's so right. I think that's going to be something on the radar, at least. I, I don't know what's going to happen to the Third Frontier Commission, but it's something I'm sure that they're thinking about. Another question. I wanted to ask a question again about uh, local government funding. We talked about some of the positive changes for health and human services and public transit, but as a former city council person, I'd be remiss in going back to some of the funding that was given to communities to do basic community services. Uh, in my time on council, we vote, I voted twice to raise taxes just to maintain the status quo. And so do you guys see any future where there will be funding to local municipalities to keep police and fire on the roads, pave roads, plow snow? Yeah, um, you know, I ran when I was running. I ran my campaign on this, and you know, it's just something that, you know, I know most of my Democratic colleagues. We, you know, we yell in about this all the time, and so I was happy that we saw these investments in Indigent Defense Fund and kind of shoring up some of the money um, that the state would take over some of these pro programs to give them other abilities. But then the day these are local governments who are elected by the people sh who should have a say in where the money is being spent instead of, you know, people in Columbus who. You know, who don't live in a big city, who don't understand the needs, and every community is different. So, um, talking across the aisle, there does not seem to be an appetite currently um, to restore the LGF local government fund specifically um, to levels. I mean, it has been decimated in years, and especially my argument is we're talking about Ohio has been one of the most hit states in the nation when it comes to opiate crisis, and who the people at the front ends, it's our local governments, our police, our fire, and they're being tasked with more to do with less to do it with. And I um, supported, we had amendments in the budget, but I think that um, we still need to keep moving the conversation forward and still have people advocating for it. I know me and my colleagues are continuously, but I do not see that coming to fruition within this budget. I, you know, one thing I would add to that that I sort of was heartened by recently was I saw that a group of sort of urban legislators and sort of more small town legislators were coming together and going out to sort of visit uh, different communities and that brought to mind you know, we'd done some work a couple of years ago where we looked at small towns in Ohio and on nearly every measure they're worse off than cities. I mean, on every measure. And so they, there's a lot of commonality there, um, but I'm not sure their political representatives of those small towns have always sort of voted along those lines and those interests. But maybe having some, you know, more communication, getting out and seeing how these things actually work, maybe that'll spark some solutions on that. And that's something that Speaker Larry Householder has actually spoken about. He, mm -hmm. when he left after being term limited the first time, went back to local government and actually did some work driving around talking to county children's services and agencies where he saw some of the ravages of the opioid crisis, kids raising other kids, I mean, because their parents are, are not there. Right. And just some of these stories that you, that just break your heart when you hear them. Another question. Yes, I wanted to ask about uh, graduate school education, uh, adv advocacy and budgeting. Um, I'm over at Cleveland State right now, and actually I'm in student leadership for uh, graduate studies. And as far as in this current budget, is there, are we seeing expansion in funding for our public institutions, particularly at the graduate level? Um, is the advocacy where we need it to be? Uh, we know that regionally, spe specifically with Cleveland, uh, uh, the success of the region is tied very closely to advanced degrees, um, to social mobility, um, is tied very closely to advanced degrees. Uh, can you speak on that? What, what are we looking at for the future here? Yes, thank, thank you so much for that question. So if, what I, um, as the ranking member of high education committees is kind of what, you know, I was exactly working on and higher education has not been a priority. It just has not in the past, you know, 
in the past eight years. Um, we have seen, um, we had a 21% increase in our OCOG funding, which is the financial need-based aid for students. And um, while I applaud those efforts, and we had an increase in the SSI, which is state student instruction, which is the money that our public universities use to lower tuitions and to make it affordable for students um, compared to um, our privates. Um, it has been ex historic investments, however, um, they're historic because we've been cutting them and not paying attention to them for a long time. Um, if you look at um, Ohio, we're 45th in most expensive public universities. So, you know, we should be at $100 million, we increased it by $20 million. So it's a step in the right direction and, you know, I, you know, you have to be realistic, especially as someone in the minority party that we were getting here before, we were talking about cutting <laughs> access and to higher education and we have this, um, um, 2025 attainment goal that yeah. all part of our um, adults um, have some kind of post-secondary, whether it be um, a college degree, graduate, or even um, a short-term certificate, they have some kind of extra credential outside of a um, high school. And in the committee, I ask every single sector from the career technicals to our um, community colleges, our universities, and not one of our sectors said we can, or even close to there. So there is so much more we need to do. We need to be working together as a higher ed um, group to try to um, get here. And I have some um, bills that will hopefully move us closer. But yes, um, we're doing good things in here, but there's so much more to be done. Do we have one more quick question? Uh, yes, so our next question comes from Twitter. Um, they say, I'd love to hear the panel uh, talk about funding for um, wraparound services, especially as they relate to uh, the Say Yes to Education campaign. That was the one thing I wanted to ask. It's a great way to close because I was going to ask about that. $550 million in DeWine's budget for wraparound services. The House added $125 million to that, and this is money that goes specifically for you know, economically disadvantaged kids who have issues coming to school in terms of health care access and things like that. So who wants to take that? Well, I would just say this is actually one of the areas where Cleveland's been in the lead. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've sort of, you know, we had the Say Yes effort, which is really important that's sort of coming to Cleveland and t because you can't just wait till kids graduate to sort of offer them sort of help and say, hey, we'll pay for your college or whatever. You've got to start way before that. And we actually started before I say yes with United Way put a, uh, these wraparound services around certain schools in Cleveland. So we've seen that it has a positive impact. Um, it's good to see the investment um, and I'm sure it's going to, I think that will attract some attention in the conference process. You know, people will have some questions about it. But I think we know that if we, you can't, you have to offer these supportive services to make sure that young kids have a chance to succeed. Really short answer, is it enough to bridge that performance gap between economically disadvantaged students and their better off peers? I don't know that it's enough, but it, uh, it will certainly be helpful. All right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We've been listening to a forum on the state budget featuring John Corlett, President and Executive Director at the Center for Community Solutions, Representative Bride Rose Sweeney, and Alicia Washington, Vice President of Government Advocacy for the Greater Cleveland Partnership. I'm Karen Castle from the State House News Bureau. Our community partner for today's forum is the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland and Policy Matters Ohio. Additionally, we welcome guests at a table hosted by the Greater Cleveland Partnership. We thank you all for being here today. Really appreciate it. That brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you all very much. This has been a great conversation. And this forum is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> for information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad. Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.